welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Abhishek Bhargava. I have been with Agile Assets for about eight years now, um, presenting uh, uh, performance measures based bridge planning, especially in this new world of Map 21 that we now know as Fast Act. Uh, and, uh, so it would be interesting to see what changes Fast Act has brought uh, to the Map 21 world. And I'll lay the ground with talking a little bit about Fast Act first. And then Mohammed is going to present uh, how you can use Agile Assets Bridge Analyst software to do some performance measures based bridge planning. So um, uh, again, the agenda is we are trying to keep it fairly simple. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about Fast Act and some of the things uh, from a planner's perspective uh, that are in this legislation. Uh, and then we want to talk about a case study uh, which talks about uh, how to develop a bridge program uh, using the Bridge Analyst software. So uh, just a quick uh, look from a planner's perspective. Uh, very simple questions. Uh, we hear them day in and day out, uh, meeting with the legislatures, meeting with uh, uh, asset management directors, with planners in our agencies. Uh, one of the things uh, that you always are worried about is the cost. Uh, you're worried about uh, what is the minimum cost you're, uh, to achieve certain performance measure goals. Uh, what is the minimum amount of funding that you need to meet the targets that you have established for your programs? Uh, uh, so that, that is a question that is asked uh, quite a lot uh, amongst the planners. Uh, another question that is asked is, uh, given allocated funding and Fast Act does provision certain uh, dollars for each individual type of program, uh, what can you do with that? Uh, what, can, what kind of performance measures can you, uh, uh, what kind of performance targets can you reach uh, given a set budget? Uh, and then you can break those, both of those questions down into, you know, what kind of strategy do I need to follow in terms of when I'm thinking about uh, what kind of program I need to fix my poor bridges, what kind of program I need to fix good bridges, uh, bridges on the NHS system versus the non-NHS system, uh, what does my preservation program need to look like, and uh, um, how many rehabilitation treatments do I need versus uh, should it really be preservation focused, uh, the entire program. And should we really think about doing replacements now, or should we postpone until later, and should the preservation program be more of our stress today? Uh, so there are questions like that uh, from a strategy perspective that you're trying to answer. Uh, and of course, uh, the planning period is important, and, and that's one of the main things that Fast Act brings today. Um, and we'll look at that in the next slide. I think one of the key differences um, uh, or maybe a couple of slides later. One of the key differences with Fast Act is it now is a five-year plan and a five-year uh, budget that is a apportionment that the Fed, Feds have actually done. So, so that is actually significantly different from the two-year program that MAP21 had talked about. Uh, so uh, before we get into uh, looking at the Fast Act and some of the more specific details about it, uh, so, uh, from a planning perspective, again, one of, the, one of the other things you're thinking about is data-driven planning. As you're thinking about all of those questions that were there on the previous slide, uh, you were basically, uh, you know, one of the things you want is uh, looking at your inventory, looking at all the inspections, especially for bridges, there is a lot of investment in how, how much uh, uh, time and effort and resources you put in uh, from an inspection perspective. Uh, and so you definitely want data-driven decisions uh, coming out of the systems that you have in place. Uh, so having an inventory uh, where the data quality is really good, having inspections on a biennial basis uh, per uh, the regulations uh, from FHWA, that is important. Uh, and then using those two, you then start putting and dealing with those constraints that you saw on the previous slide. How much money do I have? How much, uh, uh, what are my performance targets? Uh, and you put all of those constraints on your system and you kind of analyze all of those scenarios and come up with a work plan. Uh, so uh, fairly standard way of coming up with an asset management plan. Um, so, so with that background, um, I think I wanted to highlight just a few key facts associated with MAP21 versus the FAST Act. Uh, and this is obviously not a whole lot. <laughs> this is just the few key uh, things that, that I picked upon. Uh, one of the first things that I was talk uh, talking about earlier was uh, MAP21 was a two-year legislation. Um, it came up, uh, I think, in 2011 it was passed. And then it got revised a couple of times. Um, and it was about $100 billion uh, uh, for a couple of years, about $50 billion each year across all modes of transportation, um, and about, I think, uh, about $40 million under the NHPP program for uh, the highway preservation of bridges and pavements. Uh, 
but one of the things that Fast Act has changed is now uh, there is more commitment to it. There is more stability to uh, to the uh, apportionments that the, that the Feds are doing, and it's a five-year program. Uh, and what that does is um, it, it basically settles everybody down in terms of, yes, we can now think about investing more resources. Uh, we can, uh, if you're a cons uh, construction company, you can think about hiring more people and buying more new equipment. You can think about making a longer term investment. Uh, and, and, and right at the onset, the FAST Act, uh, what it does is it basically encourages you to think a little bit longer than the short term of one or two year planning. Uh, uh, which is which is a key difference. Uh, even the funding levels have increased uh, a little bit. We have uh, about three hundred million dollars, uh, billion dollars across all modes, uh, and about two hundred and twenty-five odd billion dollars for for the national highway program. So, uh, so it not only it was a long uh, more emphasis on the long-term planning, it was also more growth in in the funding, especially in the NHPP category. Um, one of the other things uh, that is important to highlight here between MAP21 and FAST Act, uh, MAP21, when it first came into being, it replaced Highway Trust Fund. And, and one of the things it did was there was essentially reduction about 30% uh, in terms of funding for non-NHS system. And what FAST Act did is uh, it basically brought the non-NHS system back on the table. Um, and, and you could use, uh, it was a new category that was identified uh, under, the, uh, under the FAST Act program, and that was uh, really neat. And so you can use, you can actually have a bigger impact on your network by including some of the non-NHS bridges. Um, uh, and so that was, I think, key when you're thinking about scenario analysis and creating work plans, uh, so that was important. Um, um, I think uh, uh, MAP21 revised a couple of times, uh, uh, but I think, if, uh, again, like Fast Act, I said, uh, uh, more investment in the longer term plan, five year, more stability. DOTs are more encouraged to think about, you know, over the next five years, what you're actually going to think about in terms of projects. Um, construction agencies are thinking about it. Um, so it's, it's everybody just mindset changes from, from more like two year and short term planning to long term planning, uh, which is quite key. Um, and then, of course, you cannot ignore the word fast, right? Why is it fast? Uh, I think there are provisions in this uh, uh, legislation which essentially talk about project delivery being efficient, project delivery being uh, more streamlined, project development being more streamlined. Um, as uh, uh, Just reading, I think one of the clauses was you have got like 45 days to name everybody who is on, needs to be involved in planning the project and delivering the project. So you've got pretty much 45 days to get all the cooks in the kitchen uh, to, to kind of get your project planned and uh, developed. Um, and then there are requirements associated with em environmental impact assessment associated with, you know, how, whether you need it or you don't need it. Um, and and that's, uh, that's, again, you know, more streamlined project planning, more emphasis on, on, on planning your projects. Uh, um, so, so, so it, again, the focus was more on the planning side with this FAST Act, uh, with the long-term planning with five years, as well as, you know, planning your uh, projects really well. Uh, so uh, this is a video that I just wanted to play uh, for a minute. Um, I think I'm going to log into. It's available on YouTube as well. There are actually a lot of uh, pieces that are actually available on YouTube, and this would be a nice little thing to look at. Current annual federal highway program funding is $41 billion. Under the FAST Act, highway funding will increase investment in fiscal year 2016 to $43.3 billion, a nearly 5.6% increase in the investment America makes to fix its aging and congested highways, bridges, and overpasses. Funding increases in fiscal years 2 through 5 will average about 2%. Current annual federal investment in the nation's transit programs is $10.7 billion. Under the FAST Act, transit funding grows in fiscal year 2016 to nearly $12 billion, a 10.2% increase. The average percentage increase in fiscal years 2 through 5 will also be roughly 2%. That's great news, says Wright, after years of federal funding uncertainty. When you don't know the resources that are going to be available, it's hard to say we're going to make a long-term commitment to a slate of projects. So, I mean, I think it really has resulted in not only the state DOTs being unable to make those long-term commitments, but also the construction industry is in a position where they're not investing in new people, in new equipment. Um, this is going to free up everybody to say, let's begin to think long-term again. Right. 
And that's just uh, uh, one person at Ashto who basically is echoing the same kind of things that's now uh, a widely recognized industry sentiment about FAST Act, which is essentially thinking more long-term, thinking more scenario-based planning where you're actually focusing more on project development. Uh, so, uh, uh, so an interesting uh, uh, thing to keep in mind uh, when, when you're thinking about scenario analysis and bridge planning specifically. So uh, uh, moving on, um, uh, like I said, I think one of the main things uh, with Fast Act has been there has been a, a, a slight growth in the funding for, um, uh, for especially the NHPP program. Um, I think uh, back in uh, with the MAP 21, it was about um, uh, close to 20, 23, uh, 22 billion dollars uh, 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 per year. Uh, and I think it went up to 23, 24 billion dollars, which is about five to 10 percent increase. Um, and each DOT, I think they, depending on the allocation formula that you uh, use, and that was used for the agency, it was uh, a DOT basically saw between five percent to maybe 15 percent increase in their funding levels. Uh, um, uh, for, for the uh, preservation of bridges and the pavements uh, on the on the NHS system primarily, um, and, and so that that again is uh, is again crucial because there is a lot of projects that you can get in there, and now there is more money available to plan the projects uh, in a more efficient manner, um, and 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 so there is and you have to do it fast. Uh, so that 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 again is you know a lot more work to do from a planning perspective. Um, and, and that money is going to grow. Uh, this is again a chart that basically shows um, how much uh, fund is available for highway uh, projects, um, and um, and it, it's going to grow over the next five or six years. Uh, so it's not like it's uh, one constant set of uh, dollars that is available across in just one year. A um, um, couple of other uh, key differences from Map 21. Um, uh, one is performance target setting uh, during program development. So uh, in MAP21, there was a clause that basically talked a little bit about, you know, if you don't meet your performance targets uh, for one reporting period, that's fine. We'll ch monitor you for another reporting period. If you don't meet it then as well, then you would basically have to uh, bear some penalties and you would have to look into, uh, you know, maybe planning your funds slightly differently, apportioning them more on the uh, maintenance side, thinking about that. Um, that that has changed with Fast Act. Now that two-year uh, reporting period clause has gone away. So uh, so that's that's something that you know again you're more accountable with respect to how you want to start planning and meeting your targets. So you you have a shorter timeline to meet your targets. You whatever you say you have to be do that. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, and I've stressed on this before as well, uh, the overall program development, uh, there is a lot more emphasis on accountability, efficiency, and effectiveness of developing projects. There are actual specific guide and deadlines and, and duration limitations uh, uh, with respect to developing your pro uh, program that, that are there in, in, in FAST uh, Act that, that one needs to look at. So um, with, with, with that background, um, uh, so, so from a planner's perspective, a lot has changed. Uh, although, you know, if, if you really look at how you calculate performance measures, uh, the, the process you follow in terms of your decision trees or your deterioration models, it's fairly standard. Those things haven't changed much, but how you execute your plans, that has changed. And so it, one needs to react to that. One needs to change the way on a day-to-day -day basis you're planning these projects. Um, uh, and, and we have always talked about at Agile Assets uh, the importance of uh, running scenarios and looking at various optimization problems because what you're really trying to do is you have limited resources and you're trying to use those resources as wisely and as efficiently as possible. And these optimization problems help you do that uh, with setting certain objectives and setting certain constraints and trying to figure out how you can best uh, invest the money. Um, uh, and, and so the uh, solution is an optimal work plan. That's what we are after here, uh, with, uh, and that, that really is, is, uh, is our goal. Um, and, and those scenarios can, uh, uh, can be you know, given certain budget, a uh, certain amount of dollars X, certain amount of dollars Y. Um, for the entire state, what is m going to be my network performance? Uh, or you can break them down a little bit more, and you can say, well, I've got so much money for, so much, uh, for each of these districts, each of these divisions, each of my regions, each of my counties. Let me uh, see what the network performance is going to be. Um, or I've got so much money for NHS system and so much money for non-NHS system. What, what is that going to be uh, in terms of network performance? Um, 
um, or, or you can actually start looking at things down, uh, going down to spe specific years, and you can say I've got so much money for each year, uh, for each net, uh, for each NHS system, uh, for for the NHS system, for the non-NHS system, for the districts, divisions, uh, and what my network performance is going to be. Me. So a lot of questions that you are thinking of uh, again to uh, uh, to do that financial planning. And you can turn the problem around and you can say, well, wait a minute, uh, I want to set performance targets because that's something that MAP21 and Fast Act both enforced um, and uh, required us to do. Uh, and, and then determine the cost for achieving those targets uh, and whether the located funding me uh, is, uh, uh, is enough for, uh, for doing that. This is more like needs-based planning at this point. Um, and again, you can keep breaking down that problem uh, uh, multiple ways to kind of uh, uh, figure out what is the best way you can actually uh, meet your targets. Uh, and can you meet your targets at all levels of the organization, whether at the district level or at the region level or the statewide level or for a particular system itself. Um, so, um, so with that uh, information, uh, I think uh, the next thing what we wanted to do was we wanted to present a case study that Mohammed has done. He's actually uh, picked up uh, uh, Georgia DOT's network. He has collaborated with Georgia on that, and he's, uh, uh, he has actually analyzed about 15,000 structures for them, and he's going to come and talk about how, how some of this background, you know, how, how you develop program uh, using these kind of concepts of uh, uh, performance-based, budget-based scenario planning. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sayyar. I'm with uh, Agile Asset for three years, over three years. So uh, the second part of the presentation will be case study on uh, uh, bridge program development for Georgia. Uh, this is based on performance measures, MAP21 performance measures. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with performance measures, but I assume that uh, I should cover performance measures very quickly. So MAP21 introduced performance measures into three categories. Um, the percentage of NHS bridges uh, classified as good condition, poor condition, and everything in between will be fair condition. So each bridge has three components, deck, superstructure, and substructure during the inspection. The inspector uh, rates each component uh, between zero, uh, from zero to nine. Zero means failed uh, condition, and nine means brand new. So for uh, here you see that if the condition is seven or better than seven, the condition is, uh, the rating is, uh, rating is uh, over seven. The condition will be good. If it's five or six, it's fair. And if it's uh, one, two, three, four, it will be poor. So for one bridge, you may have deck and superstructure in good condition, but the substructure in poor condition. Now, if you have this case, what's the overall condition classification for that bridge? Based on MAP21, the bridge goes with the worst condition. So in this example, the uh, deck is eight, uh, superstructure rating is seven, but substructure is four. So deck and superstructure in good condition, but the substructure is in poor condition. But the overall condition classification for this bridge will be poor. And this is the, how we calculate the performance measures at network level. The percentage of deck area classified as good condition at the network level uh, will tell us that what's the network performance measure is. So for example, for 15,000 bridges, uh, based on the deck area in good condition, the percentage of good condition divided by, I mean, uh, um, the amount of uh, deck area in good condition divided by the whole deck uh, area will be the percentage of deck area in good condition, and the same thing for poor and fair. Here is the uh, 
constraint and minimum condition identified by uh, MAP21, you see that here is the 10% maximum of deck area can be in uh, poor condition or a structure deficient. Basically, structure deficient is very um, identical to um, poor condition. So MAP21 requires all state to keep the percentage of poor condition or structure deficient structures under 10%. And if they fail to meet that requirement for three consecutive year, they will have some limitation to use NHPP budget. And we don't see anything on poor, or anything on good or fair condition here. So states may go to uh, reduce the number of poor bridges and may neglect to take care of good or fair bridges. Here is one example from the slides that MAP20, I mean FH, FHWA published uh, a couple of years ago. And you see that this is um, uh, about how to determine the significant progress to achieve the performance targets. You see here, uh, uh, here you see that the state put the, uh, the baseline for good condition is 35 and they put the target 33 and they achieved 34% after two years. And still, they achieved the target. So it means that even if you let your, t your network uh, to lose some of the good bridges, still uh, you, you achieve the target and you don't get penalized for that. But is it a good practice for that? Uh, we'll see that. Uh, Abhishek uh, talked about the analysis period and the should we go for two years, four years, five years, or longer than that. We know that asset management, especially for bridges, is not a short-term practice. A bridge doesn't deteriorate over two years or three years. We know that bridge may it may take several years for a bridge to get deteriorated. So we use the uh, 10 years uh, as an analysis period, and the number of structures are both NHS and non-NHS uh, bridges. In scenario one, we just followed what uh, MAP21 instructed. So we cared about poor bridges. We put a limitation and constraint on poor bridges to keep the uh, network level poor bridges under 2%. In scenario two, we added another constraint for good bridges. So we have two constraints, the same 2% for poor bridges, but we added 60% uh, constraint for good bridges. And in third scenario, we increase the percentage of good bridges. And we compare the outcome of the uh, analysis. Uh, the, bridge analyst, uh, the bridge analyst framework uh, used the, the condition data, which means the inspection uh, data and uh, in, in, uh, with other bridge data, the bridge analyst uh, identified the condition indexes and using the performance and deterioration model, it, predicted, it predicts the uh, future condition and using decision tree, it assigns uh, treatment to that, to each component, and then it generates the uh, projects to achieve that constraint and um, based on the scenario we define. Here is the uh, result of scenarios. Three scenarios, we see that scenario S1, S2, and S3 here. And again, in S2, we have 60% good. And in S3, we have 62% in good. And in S1, we have nothing, no constraint on good. 
And this is the poor condition before applying treatment. So you see that initial value for all scenarios are 0.7. In poor condition, it means that their network is in pretty good condition. So they don't have much poor bridges. But over years, you see that the number of uh, the percentage of poor bridges will increase. And for example, for 2022, this graph shows that the, based on analysis, we will have uh, over 40% in scenario one. And since we define 2% as a maximum for poor condition, the program, the bridge analyst program, uh, generate project to reduce that number to 2%. This is the same thing, but for good condition. And we see that in scenario one, we don't have any constraint on good condition. So the uh, value for good condition, the percentage of good condition is decreasing over years. Uh, and it makes sense, it's common sense, because we don't have any constraint on good condition scenario one but we have better conditions in scenario two and scenario three over years. And here is the long-term network performance measures. Uh, after 10 years, you see that in scenario one, we have 2%, in all scenarios, we have 2% in poor condition as we defined as a constraint. And in scenario two and three, we have 60 and 62% in good condition. But in scenario one, we have only 7%. And that makes sense because we didn't put any constraint in, in good condition in scenario one. So you see that the best scenario, I mean the best performance measures uh, is associated with scenario three. Now the question is uh, how much cost uh, it applies to, uh, to us to achieve the target. So you may think that scenario one should be the cheapest one and the uh, scenario three will need uh, more money to achieve target. This is a treatment cost versus time. And you see that at early stage, 2016, 2017, and up to 2020, we have almost none cost uh, associated with scenario one, but we have some costs in scenario two and three. But if you look at the total cost here, you see that the scenario one has the highest cost here. And scenario three has the least cost. Uh, so does it make sense uh, or is it magic? Uh, to see that how it happened, I go to this slide. You see that in first five uh, years, the scenario one has almost none cost. That's a cumulative cost in the in first five years. But scenario two and three uh, has more cost. But over years, you see that this gap between scenario uh, one and scenario two and scenario three. Actually, the scenario one uh, required 50% uh, more cost compared to scenario two and three even though the um, uh, long-term condition was the worst one. And why that happened? If you look at the distribution of treatment, we see that the scenario one has the minimum preservation treatment and the maximum replacement treatment. We know that the replacement treatment is a very uh, high cost treatment. But scenario three, on the other hand, 
it uh, has the highest low cost treatment, which is preservation, and the least number of replacements. So it means that by doing early stage low cost treatment and focusing on good condition, we can end up with uh, better performance condition, network level condition, and the lower cost. And this is the summary and conclusion. Uh, Abhi Sheikh uh, talked about the MAP21 performance measures and the constraint to minimum cost to achieve performance targets. And uh, the second part means that, as I said, MAP21 put target and defined requirement on poor condition. So going beyond what MAP21, uh, which means that defining uh, scenarios like scenario two and three uh, will benefit us more. So just compliance with uh, annual performance targets and MAP21 requirement may not uh, end up with the best scenario and bridge planning pro, uh, practice. Uh, the scenario and the constraint uh, I used in this case study was the same, um, was the same and uh, constant um, uh, constraint over years, but uh, with using varying the annual performance target uh, over years, we may uh, achieve a better and more uniform spending over 10 years. Uh, still, we need to run other scenarios. And good news here is using bridge analyst, each scenario took only three, four minutes to be run. So the user can uh, run several scenarios a day and compare them and pick the best scenario. And the last, uh, Item is focus, as I said, focusing on good performance measures uh, ends up with uh, more preservation treatment uh, and low cost treatment, and it will benefit uh, benefit us more in long term. Uh, uh, if we delay the treatment and if we ignore good condition and delay treatment for them, uh, we may end up with uh, high cost uh, uh, treatment like replacement or um, heavily construction for that. So at this point we will ask the audience if anybody has any questions for Abhishek or for Mohammed. Good presentation. Uh, this is Zhongren Wang from California DOT. We do have uh, uh, some challenges, you know, uh, dealing with MAP21. So, but certainly you are using MAP21 to manage your bridge program, right? So my question is, have all this data you used been validated from any DOTs? Is that real data you're using? Oh yeah, this is uh, real data. That's okay. a G, uh, G dot data. Okay, so yeah. are the, uh, then is GDOT using MAP21 to manage their program, or they're just using MAP21 to report the data to Federal Highway? Um, or both? I'm just trying to differentiate between the reporting needs and also management needs. Because say like uh, some DOTs, they ha already have their entrenched way of managing all these assets, say like a bridge or pavement, right? So the MAP21, when we talk with Federal Highway, it uh, looks like the Feds has no mandate about how DOTs should manage their assets. Instead, they just require as a reporting business here, right? So I just try to clarify that and whether uh, there is any consistency across the board for all the other DOTs in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know that. When you report uh, performance measures to FHWA, you need to define your targets first. Uh, so, and then based on your target, 
they identify that if you achieve your target or not. Um, but um, regarding G dot, uh, they are not using performance measures, uh, MAP21 performance measures for bridge analysts. It just we just imp implemented that, and but they will use it. So it's not something that they're using now. Anyway, I, let me just comment again. So, <laughs> a good question. Yes, we, we know that when we report to the Fed, you know, we should have a target or goal whatsoever, right? The issue is, you know, say like, uh, I just use Caltrans as an uh, example. Because we already have our own way of managing the thing. We have our own way of uh, allocating budget. And we have our own way of correspondence between the bridge or asset condition versus the different treatment we use, right? So here, you know, if all of a sudden the feds change their yardstick, you know, says, okay, now you measure this way, should our DOT also manage or change our way or reestablish the com correspondence between the different type of treatment versus asset condition, right? So that really create a lot of confusion. And in our allocating of our step funds, you know, right now we, we really have a, a lot of challenge in California. So, because we, we're waiting on one hand of the uh, finalized, uh, the feds to finalize their rulemaking. The other hand, you know, we have to make, make sure our 10 year step plans got implemented, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, the DOT is really, you know, we have a hard time basically dealing with the, this MAP21 because we don't know how we should comply. Yeah, uh, maybe I can add a few things here. Um, so first of all, as far as inspections are concerned, um, obviously you have the federal file and you have the ASHTO files that you have to submit, and, and those are specified formats, whatever they are. So that's what most DOTs are doing uh, with, with once you have the inventory and inspection information in the system. So uh, this percentage, fair, good, poor, uh, these things, they're essentially looked at uh, primarily from the perspective of developing your asset management plan, right? Uh, so, again, there are no hard stipulations there. There's no specific guidelines with respect to um, this is exactly how your performance measure should get defined. For bridges, uh, yes, MAP21 did went ahead, and one of the slides that Mohammed showed said that if any one of your deck superstructure or substructure elements is in poor condition state, then that means the entire structure should be classified as poor, right? So there was a stipulation. Maybe tomorrow they will come and say, no, wait a minute. Uh, Two of the other components are really good, and maybe the bridge as an entire structure should not be classified poor. It should be classified fair, uh, especially, and there might be rules associated with if superstructure and substructure are in good condition, uh, then even though deck is in poor condition, maybe the entire structure doesn't need to get classified as uh, poor for that matter. So maybe there are those kind of rules that might change, uh, but that's, uh, uh, those are, I think when I look back at five years ago and 10 years ago and how we used to report and what we used to do to plan and prepare a, a work plan, things have changed drastically from, from there to, to how our legislation is today. Uh, so we cannot rule out those kind of uh, lessons learned kind of practices um, in the future as well. I don't know if that makes sense and kinds of answers uh, your concern associated with, you know, uh, can things still change? Yes, things can still change, but I think they're also at a higher level. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, I got a question. I've lost track a little bit about the uh, FAST Act, so I'm surprised that we are still managing using NBI conditions. Why is it when they, I think they had part of MAP21 forced the states to do this, you know, all the uh, NBEs, MBEs, so like a more quantifiable inspection process, why are they still using these, you know, nebulous indices that are completely subjective? Want to answer that? Yeah, NBE, um the, uh, it was required in uh, October 1st, 2014, and many states couldn't implement that. So 
they are pretty new to that. So I think that uh, states are struggling with uh, element level inspection still is not uh, mature. So um, in GDOT, uh, they reported all bridges, I mean, uh, at limit element level inspection last year and this year, but I know that uh, there are a lot of states that haven't implemented or have hard time with doing that. Uh, but to me, I think that uh, they need to collect all of data, NB and NBI data, and uh, try to compare them and come up with a maybe uh, um, translation between NBE and NBI before they put legislation based on NB and element level data. So eventually that will happen. Any other questions? Yeah, that's correct. That's element, element level data is required for NHS. Yeah. Yeah, so they cannot manage other structure. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, with the fast stack, one thing that happened, Pascal, was uh, they also brought the non-NHS bridges into the NHPP program. Uh, uh, and there is some uh, funding for that, but there are clauses associated with it, too. Um, uh, so it, it's still for the NHS primarily. That's true. So, yeah. Sorry about that. Steve, another question? Well, I, I, I have like three things. One for, one for Pascal, <laughs> which is we only started doing the ASHDO elements or the, the NBE inspections this year. We still don't know how we're going to do bridge modeling because our models do not integrate the quantity of defect, which is the new, the new component of this. So it'll be a while before you know we are actually doing reverse translation of our uh, NBE inspections to NBI so we can do modeling. So we're a little bit you know, and I'm assuming most states are kind of behind that curve right now because I don't see a whole lot of models where folks have been able to come up with new needs models using percent defect or quantity of defect. That's something that urgently needs to get done, I think. Um, so that said, that's kind of why we're not there. I'm with you, we should be there. We should have been thinking about this for a while and we haven't. Um, I wanna commend Mohammed for proving that the performance part of FHWA does not communicate with the asset management part of FHWA because we would never do it, we would never have performance measures that drive a worst first approach mm -hmm. to managing our bridges, which is what the percent poor metric does. The question I wanted to ask is, um, this is interesting in isolation with bridges, but when you consider pavements, pavements also have penalties. So you really need to do this kind of modeling in you know, portfolio analysis or ATOA to really look at where your greatest penalties are going to be. Because on the pavement side, what folks don't recognize generally is pavements deteriorate far more quickly than bridges do. You know, Mohammed made a very good point that um, bridge deterioration is slow. You're not going to trip the metric nearly as quickly on the bridge side as you are on the pavement side, which could beg for more, pave more funding on the pavement side. The, the good thing about performance metrics is it could, dr if they were crafted properly, could drive us to better management practices. But I would never establish a management practice based on the metrics that are proposed now. If they could come up with good metrics that would drive keeping the good good, which is also what Mohammed proved, is you can keep the good good at a lot lower cost, um, we could get a lot more mileage out of the funding that we get. Uh, to answer that point, uh, I was presenting something similar to this presentation a couple months ago in Minneapolis, and I met with a guy from uh, Washington DOT, and he was from pavement department, and he said that they ran the same analysis on poor and good performance measures on pavement, and they got the same result. So, yeah, they got the same point and they decided to focus on good condition instead of let it be fall into poor condition and then 
they pick it up for treatment. So I think that that's a general point that low cost treatment and high cost treatment and we can do early stage low cost treatment to keep our network in good condition. One of the things, Steve, uh, is also um, you saw uh, one of the graphs that Mohammed showed towards the end, uh, the, last, the fifth year, the tenth year, you were actually spending a lot of money. So yeah, one of the things I like about Fast Act is it's a five year. I would love it for it to be like seven or ten year, but it's a five year. Uh, so it, 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 it also lets you see what is the cost of not doing those bridge things in the next two or three years because bridges don't deteriorate that fast, but the cost is still incurred in the five-year framework. So, um, so, so that's where probably you start seeing the bridge and the pavement kind of level off uh, in the long term, cost-wise for sure. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess suggestion, try a multi-year analysis and you'll see completely different results. But it's something else. Uh, actually, a question to everyone here. So assume we do collect data on all these elements for bridges. Do we know the rules how to compute performance of a bridge, given all, all those values? Are there special rules? You mean translation between? You mean translation between elements and components? Yeah. So you compute got uh, did all your inspection for how many 55 elements what's your bridge rating in the end how do you compute that uh i think that's something that uh, uh pascal asked about classification, so for example, superstructures. So you have many other elements, and then you can roll it up to the super element, to the spans, to the bridges, right. and we manage towards that. So we have a KPI that is at the bridge level that can have sub-classifications as well. So we are managing towards, there are more quantifiable inspections, and therefore more, more prescript. I think the management is more real. I mean, it's more, I mean, of course, it's, you know, it's quantifiable compared to a subjective, you know, one through seven, mm, yeah, it's a five, you know, so, no, it's not like this, right? So, so they have developed ways, but maybe because they have been doing it for more than, you know, 50 years, so maybe in five years from now, with the cooperation of all the states, we'll, you know, we'll get there, right? So, I think. Just to follow up on that point, and maybe some other things that are being said around here is, um, and there's really nothing stopping you from doing more detail, right? In fact, all these performance measures that we're talking about here are reports, essentially. I mean, I don't even think the feds are even requiring you to manage your your network like this. I mean, they're, it, they expect you to manage your network in as best condition as you can, just so long as you meet those requirements. And so long as your reporter, you can remit your reports that yeah, sure, we're, we're meeting it. That, that's, that's what's important. It's kind of sad that they, you know, they, they, they kind of chickened out. And they did it in bridges, and they did it also in, in pavements. I think they use the same kind of metrics that everyone has been always been using and still talking about the, the next step, the next level of detail. Um, but I, mean, I would argue that anybody who, who is, wants to go down that route should, and the network will be better for it. So that, I think that's an important point. Yeah. Uh to add to that point, uh, I had a discussion with Georgia, and they were complaining that we are capturing th those data. We are collecting that level of details data. So we want to use it. So they want to go that route. I want to thank Mohammed and Abishak for presenting for us this afternoon. Mm -hmm.